back. Okay. Um, we're going to try and do this without the slide presentation, but I want to thank, I want to give many thanks to the, the Amherstburg Freedom Museum for allowing me to put on this presentation uh, on masonry, and in particular, Prince Hall masonry. Uh, which is a subject that is often overlooked in 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 studying black history and uh, masonry at large. Now, in a, in order to understand this, I'm going to try and start off with a brief explanation of Freemasonry. Um, you know, it's it's a subject that many ask about, and it's one of the hardest questions to answer. But it's not easier to describe sometimes what it is not. So I'm going to just start off by saying masonry masonry is not a cult, it is not a religion, it is not a political organization, it is not, believe it or not, a secret society, and it is not necessarily a charitable organization. Now that I've told you some of the things Masonry is not, I'll make a feeble attempt to briefly explain what has taken a multitude of author, authors over a number of centuries to put into words. Masonry or Freemasonry is a fraternity. In fact, it is one of the oldest fraternities in the world. Its true age has been lost in antiquity, but the formal organization we see today was formally organized in England in 1717 when the first official Grand Lodge was held. Now, there is much speculation on how the initial lodges that formed this Grand Lodge were formed. There is little doubt they are highly influenced by the guilds of stonemasons who built cathedrals and castles from the time of the Middle Ages. Now I have in my possession there's a, a, there was a book, uh, a, a poem is actually called the Hollywood Manuscript or the Regis Poem that was found in the uh, historical archives in England and once people started looking into it they realized that it in fact were Masonic charges written uh, and there's some debate upon the date when this book was written, uh, most notable scholars have it written about 1390. Some think it was 1394, and others have it going back as the latter part of the 900s. But there's no doubt when a mason reads these uh, 60, I believe, three stanzas, that it is full of Masonic ideology, Masonic symbolism, and a lot of what we know in masonry today is found in this poem. So these original lodges can uh, is estimated to go back at least that far. Now I mentioned earlier that masonry is not a cult. Unlike, unlike cults, masonry does not require its members to blindly follow a person, religion, or dangerous ideology. Most cults will accept anyone who follows their doctrine. Masons do not actively solicit members and is selective in who can join. Masonry does not does practice rituals to help constantly consistently teach through symbols and, and, and allegories how men should conduct themselves at all times in our society and develop their own character for the betterment of society. Now I stated masonry was not religion religion. Not to mean that religion does not play a major part in masonry. In fact, it's a vital element in, in masonry. For no man can become a mason who is an atheist and does not have a belief in a supreme being. Masonry encourages everyone to be active in the religion and church of their choice. But free, Freemasonry does not tell a person which religion he should practice or how he should practice it. There are over the years, many prominent ministers have been and are Masons. Now, Masonry as an organization does not involve itself in politics of the land, but does stress that all Masons must uphold all social laws and live in a manner that sets an example on how men should behave at all times. It doesn't mean that Masons as individuals can't try to change things, but change must take place in legal ways. Uh, in Canada, there were six prime ministers that were Masons. There were 16 pre premiers of the province of Ontario who were Masons. I often talk about the uh, founding fathers of the, of the after the American Revolution. Uh, many of them were Masons. George Washington was a Mason, Benjamin Franklin, and even Paul Revere was the secretary of his lodge. These were all men of distinction who were all Masons. 
And yes, Masonry is not a secret society, but it can be described as a society with a few secrets. Masons do certainly do not make a secret of how of the fact that they are members of the fraternity. In most cases, Masons go out of their way to let everyone know who they are by the rings on their fingers, their lapel pins, and even the emblems that they display on their cars. In most lodges, lodges publicly display where and when they hold meetings. So there is no secret in, in who Masons are and how they want to present themselves. Now, Masonry is not necessarily a charitable organization, for it, but it is hard to find a group of men who do more charitable work. Masons are deeply involved in helping others, spread, spending an average of $1.4 million every day in the United States. Very seldom do you actually see the word Mason associated with a multiple of charitable organizations, but there is definitely Masonic involvement. And most Masonic lodges, most Masonic Grand Lodges have their own specific charities that they give annually uh, uh, un, un, without any hesitation. Now, what is masonry? Well, entire books have been written to try and define masonry. In its simplest terms, it is a selective organization that attempts to make good men better, who in turn practice what they have learned in everything they do. And there are absolutely uh, libraries of books on the subject. Now, I've often heard and seen on doc documentaries, uh, you know, the sinister side of masonry where you know, it's an organization intent to take over the world or influence the world's politics. One thing should be remembered. Masonry is made up of lodges who belong to a Grand Lodge. And every Grand Lodge is synonymous, is, uh, is, is autonomous to itself. From the Grand Lodge of England to the Grand Lodges of every province, of every state, there's Grand Lodges in an um, untold number of countries around the world. There is no supreme power in masonry. Every Grand Lodge is autonomous to itself. Now, there is conferences that are held every year. There is a conference of Grand Masters of the different Grand Lodges in Canada. Prince Hall, for example, they have the, a conference where the Grand Masters meet. And these are more to pass information, to be aware of things that are coming, but there is no supreme body that regulates or can control any individual's Grand Lodge. So the ability for Masons to come together in such a way to try and take over the world is totally uh, a fabrication. Now we're here really to talk about Prince Hall Masonry which is a unique branch of Masonry onto itself. Now Prince Hall Masons is a Masonic organization made up of primarily men of color and this was a result of the social conditions at the time. But Prince Hall Masonry does not discriminate against who is allowed to join, as long as they meet the basic requirements of membership. You will find many ethnic groups, religions, races, nationalities, all represented in Prince Hall Masonry today. And any discussion of Prince Hall Masonry is not complete without first examining its origins. Prince Hall Masons have struggled for legitimate recognition from the time a warrant was first received from the Grand Lodge of England moderns. And all too often the study of Prince Hall Masonry focuses on Prince Hall himself and because of the many falsehoods printed by others about Prince Hall, some have questioned the Prince Hall story in its entirety. And then to add to the confusion on the history of Prince Hall, there was a book written in 1903 by a very well-meaning individual it was called The Official History of Prince Hall Among Colored People by William Grimshaw. And in his attempt to enhance Prince Hall, he actually created some falsehoods that have been since debunked. And because of these falsehoods, again, it led to question uh, Prince Hall. But I always tell people the Prince Hall story, if you're going to look at Prince Hall, the factual uh, the facts of Prince Hall himself are all one needs to know to find out what this unbelievable individual was and what he did. Now, what we know about Prince Hall, we're not exactly sure when he was born. Uh, his grave marker has him born in 1748. Scholars who have studied Prince Hall masonry uh, and some of the, and the many documents that are left behind 
has him possibly being born in 1735, 1737. Uh, in a monument that's actually in Cambridge, it just says the 1730s. So there's there's a lot of question on on what Prince Hall. Excuse me, when when Prince Hall. Uh, was actually born, but we know when he died, and we know the things that he did during his life. Now, the birth the birthplace, and actual date of Prince Hall is not known. Uh, there's where there was in Grimshaw's book, he had him being born in Barbados. Uh, scholars have tried to uh, check on this. They, there's no evidence that Prince Hall was ever born in Barbados. Uh, he was not a Methodist minister. But he is extremely active in his church. Now there are no true pictures of Prince Hall, but but there is a but there are there are artists renditions of Prince Hall. But I did find a description written by a Dr. Jeremy Benlap, Reverend Dr. Jeremy uh, Benlap, uh, who described Prince Hall at the time. Uh, this individual was a renowned historian who lived in Boston. And he actually was was one of the founders of the Massachusetts Historical Society. And in one of his writings, he referred to Prince Hall as a tall, lean Negro of great dignity. He always carries himself the air of one who ruled many. Uh, so it, it was said that anybody who came in Prince Hall's presence uh, was automatically uh, recognized him for the character, the man he was. Now, he did not fight in the Revolutionary War. But he was one of 50 men who was raised in Irish Lodge number 441. He was a leather tanner by trade. He was a renowned caterer. It was stated that whenever a well-to-do person wished the best catering in eastern Massachusetts, they would send word to Prince Hall. Uh, they said he would come in with, depending upon the size, 10, sometimes 20 people to cater huge banquets that were being held at the time. Now, he, what we also know is that he was very active in his church. He was very active in the black community of Boston, active setting up uh, schools for black children. In fact, he originally, initially used his own house to set up some of the first schools for children to attend. Um, he was active in the abolitionist movement. Uh, we have on record many letters that he sent to Congress uh, many records that he sent at both the, the uh, at the state level and at the federal level on on the abolishment of slavery. Uh, he was very active at the in the Back to Africa movement, which was a very active movement at the time, and a number of people from the United States escaped slaves, free men of color actually went back to Africa, and that's another interesting story unto itself. He was active in charitable organizations that not only helped fleeing slaves, but helped all poor people in the Boston area. And it is noted that he uh, was known to have helped the poor Irish immigrants that were coming into the United States. He was a sought-after caterer. He was very active in politics. He was a registered voter, a landowner, and of course, he was very active in his Masonic Lodge. Now, the Masonic story of Prince Hall Masonry begins when 50 men of color were initiated into Irish Lodge number 411 in Boston on March 6, 1775. Now the legitimacy of this action has been reviewed by many Masonic scholars and there has been no fault found in what Irish Lodge did initiating these five men. But with the outbreak of the War of Independence, Irish Lodge number 411 was moved from the Boston area three months later, and these newly made Masons were left with a deputation or permit that allowed them to meet as a lodge, parade on designated occasions, bury their dead with a Masonic funeral. And Prince Hall was, was the master of this group. They called themselves African Lodge, but without a legitimate charter, uh, they knew that they could... Uh, uh, could not confer degrees and therefore could not um, increase their membership. Now documents show that African Lodge did meet as a lodge, publicly held 
uh, parades on, on designated uh, occasions and there were reports in the paper they actually would would have pay to have a report put in the paper when they did these events now without a legitimate warrant or charter from the Grand Lodge of England uh, the Brothers of Amer of African Lodge knew they could not raise any new members so their only remedy was to acquire a legitimate charter from the Grand Lodge of England with the outbreak of the American War of Independence, there was virtually no communication between American colonies and England. And it wasn't until the end of the war, September 3rd, 1783, communications were allowed to resume. Now we know two letters were sent by Prince Hall requesting assistance in acquiring a warrant from the Grand Lodge of England. And on March 2nd, 1784, and the second was on June 30th, 1784. You know, we're fortunate Prince Hall kept what he called his record book. And he kept copies of all the communications he sent out uh, uh, regarding the Masonic lodges. And he kept those, and he kept copies of the correspondence received, which has been just a, 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 a trove of information for historians who are still studying this, this great man. Now, these requests for a warrant su were successful. And on September 29th, 1784, a warrant was issued by the Grand Lodge of England for African Lodge number 459. By the very name of this lodge, there is no doubt uh, that England knew who these, these five gentlemen were. Now, there was some confusion in getting the payments to England, but all matters were fine. James Scott, uh, brother in law of Jan, John Hancock, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's it's interesting the uh, African Lodge warrant appears to be the only known warrant or charter issued by the Grand Lodge of England that is still in existence today. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate in 1869 there was actually a fire broke out in the lodge hall. The worshipful master went in on his hands and knees in the blazing building and retrieved the warrant. And the warrant that we have today actually shows. Uh, the f the fringes of the warrant and where the burn marks were as it came through the fire. Now records show that communications between African Lodge 459 continued for many years um, with with England, but there was very little correspondence received from England, and then they continued until uh, the death of Prince Hall in 1806. Uh, you have to understand that during this time. There were many uh, lodges, of course, in the United States. After the War of Independence, the Caucasian lodges uh, met and started forming their Grand Lodge. It is known that Prince Hall did request and sent out information. And as it was at the time, the conditions at the time, his lodge was denied. Uh, even the uh, legitimate, he, he did not recognize his lodge at the time within the other lodges. But it appears that uh, Prince Hall did ask the Grand Lodge of England whether his charter would empower him to set up other lodges. Now, there was no evidence that this question was ever answered, but in 1797, Prince Hall received a letter uh, from a Peter Montron who lived in Philadelphia that 10 other brethren were desirous of having a warrant for a lodge. And in 1797, Prince Hall set up a lodge in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Providence, Rhode Island. And it should be noted that both lodges at that time still used the name and number of African Lodge number 459. Now to give some perspective of what was going on in the United States within the Masonic uh, fraternities, there was a lodge in Virginia by the name of Fredericksburg. And this was a f uh, started off as a self-formed lodge. In other words, these men came together, um, created a lodge without a warrant, they actually set up other lodges and they finally received a warrant from the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, and during that time, they uh, actually set up uh, a number of lodges in that particular area. Now, a renowned Masonic scholar by the name of Hugo Tashish, who uh, was re responsible for over 74 Masonic publications, stated that the right of this particular lodge, Fredericksburg Lodge, to issue these charters 
was recognized by the craft at the time. And what's even more interesting, this was the lodge that George Washington himself initially came from. Now, by 1815, there were four lodges set up by African Lodge 459 in the state of Pennsylvania. And then on December 27th, 1815, these four lodges came together to form their own Grand Lodge. Now, it appears that there was some dissent among the lodges, uh, and there was some bickering that was going on in this lodge that I'll talk about later that ended up causing other problems, but there was also uh, a lodge set up in New Jersey. There were lodges set up in New York. By 1845, uh, four lodges came together in New York and set up their Grand Lodge. So you see Prince Hall Masonry in the Eastern United States starting to spread, setting up their lodges, and then coming together to form a Grand Lodge. Now, what was happening in Pennsylvania eventually caused that lodge to split into two Grand Lodges, which was causing problems. And in order to try and overcome those particular problems, the Grand Lodge of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts called a meeting to try and settle the quarreling that was going on in Pennsylvania. There was dignitaries from from New York that we're aware of. I believe there were some, possibly some dignitaries from some of the other Grand Lodges that were set up at the time. And during several days of deliberation, uh, they came up with operating articles were drawn up and the feuding lodges in Pennsylvania came together. But what happened is these articles that they agreed upon created at that time what they called the National Compact. Now, remember I said there was no higher authority of the Grand Lodge. This National Compact was originally supposed to be a group with representatives from the various districts and Grand Lodges that would come together to promote Prince, the growth of Prince Hall Masonry, bring the various lodges into closer unity, and provide a means of settling jurisdictional and other disputes. Uh, and it was supposed to be nothing more than a, a, a bit of an oversight committee. But as it goes with a little bit of power, um, things can get out of control. Now, the National Compact is supposed to hold the role as maybe an advisor, but evolved into one of supreme authority over all the lodges that formed the Prince Hall family of lodges. In effect, became a National Grand Lodge. Now, this action was without precedence in Masonic history. And as so often happens in human history when there is assumed power without an established structure to regulate it, the power will become un unwielding. And as uh, so often said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The National Compact was in existence for 35 years. Uh, they demanded fees from the different lodges. They were put themselves in a position where they could suspend individuals, suspend lodges who did not follow their edicts. Um, and eventually the other lodges, the Grand Lodges, got so disillusioned that after 35 years, uh, you know, um, they finally withdrew any recognition of this, this body. And this body, uh, 35 years later, ceased to exist. Down the road it did cause other problems, but that's another story that we'll, we can talk about another time. Now to understand the early history of the Prince Hall Masonry Canada, one needs to review the black history in Canada and the United States during this time. Uh, for this particular presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the region what was known Upper Canada or Canada West, uh, which is currently the province of Ontario. And in 1791, the first lieutenant governor appointed to govern Canada West was John Greaves. Um, he was a British Army general. And before coming to Canada, uh, he was also a member of the British Parliament, where, where it, he was on record of uh, describing slavery as an offense against Christianity. Now, during this time, slavery was no stranger to Canada. Uh, you know, the, uh, it, it was known that the though the slave population was low, there was a steady increase in the population 
as the British loyalists migrated to Canada from the United States, particularly after the Revolutionary War, and many of them brought slaves with them into Canada. Now, Governor John Simcoe became aware of a reported story of a Coley Cooley, who in 1793, when in 1793 a young slave woman was violently removed from Fort Erie, Canada, to be sold to, in the United States. It appears this incident put Governor Simcoe on a mission to remove slavery from Canada West. He knew he would have great opposition to abolishing slavery outright as members of the Legislative Assembly and powerful individuals were themselves slave owners. He pushed for a compromise with the intent to remove slavery from Canada West and on July 9, 1793, an act was passed entitled the Act to Prevent the Further Introduction of Slaves and the Term of Contracts of Servitude within this province. Now, the act stated that all slaves in Canada would remain enslaved, but no new slaves could be brought into Canada West. Children born to a female slave after the passage of the act could be, would be freed at the age of 25. Therefore, anyone who was a slave entering into Canada West after this time would be considered a free man. Now, it would be another 41 years before slavery would be fully abolished within the British Empire with the Slavery Abolition Act passed on August 1st, 1834 in the British Parliament. Now, sentiments in the United States were going in the opposite direction. In the same year, Canada West passed the act to prevent the further introduction of slaves into Canada, the United States Congress enacted the first Fugitive Slave Act. Because by this time, there were already uh, sl uh, slave-free states, uh, such as Pennsylvania, uh, such as uh, Massachusetts, where you know slavery was had been abolished, but they, in order to prevent slaves from getting into these areas and then uh, becoming free, this Fugitive Slave Act required the return of slaves who escaped to other states. This act ensured those who escaped from slavery from the South were still in danger of being caught anywhere in the United States. Even free men of color were in danger of being kidnapped by unscrupulous bounty hunters and taken to the slave states and forced into slavery. There were many who made their business on being nothing more than bounty hunters and going north to find escaped slaves. So from 1793, uh, the, uh, the enacting of the United States, the U U.S. Fugitive Slave Act, left Canada West as the only viable refuge from the bounty hunters looking to return uh, escaped slaves. And from this period forward, many escaped slaves and free men of color made their, made their way to Canada West. Now, many making their way were accomplished free men, who included Prince Hall Masons. Now, in 1850, a new Fugitive Slave Act was passed in the United States that not only strengthened the existing laws, but imposed greater penalties for those enabling escaped slaves. It is often said that this act put the United States on the slope leading to the Civil War, and this only increased the migration of slaves and men of color into Canada. It is said this was one of the this was from from uh, 1850 until the Civil War saw the largest migration of men of color into Canada. Um, and and be, and as all too often uh, we think of uh, migration again, we only think of slaves. But there were educated men, there were businessmen uh, who came through uh, and got into Canada, uh, and it was in the the under and this was also during the time of the Underground Railroad, which was a time that uh, the the Masonic bodies, both Prince Hall and not Prince Hall, were active in in bringing slaves up to Canada. Now, though many slaves escaped to Canada West, there were many notable men of color. Who included in this who are included in this migration? I'm going to name some of these people, and each one of these people, believe it or not, is is, des is deserving of further research. You could I could talk another entire uh, episode just on some of these individuals. But there was Dr. Martin Delaney, Reverend Benjamin Stewart, Josiah Henson, Abraham D. Shad, George Shreves, just to name a few, who became celebrated citizens within the black communities in Canada West. 
and this migration, as I had said, included Prince Hall men from Prince Hall lodges. It was only natural that they wanted to continue their Masonic association. It was not surprising to see these men in the lodges set up in Canada. Now, out of these individuals that I mentioned, I always like to uh, mention the name of Dr. Josiah Henson because not only was he a unique individual, he was the a Methodist uh, minister, he was a community leader, uh, you know, he was one of the principal organizers of the Don Settlement near Dresden, uh, you know, he was a publisher, uh, he wrote a number of books, but specifically The Life of Joseph Hans Hansen, formerly a slave, was published. Uh, this individual went to England, I believe on three different occasions, not only to in, uh, talk about his book, but to get British support of the slave condition that was going on in the United States. Um, he was known to have met personally with Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was the, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, there was so much outcry about her book when it first came out because what you find out in history was that a lot of the people in the northern United States really didn't have a good understanding of what was happening down south in the plantations. And they tried to uh, uh, just falsify so many of the things that she had written in her, in her novel that the year later she wrote another book called The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And this is where she specifically mentions Josiah Henson as being one of the uh, her inspirations I, uh, and where she received a lot of information to put into her book. If you go to Dresden today, you'll, there is a, uh, at the grave marker of Josiah Henson, in the middle of the monument, there is a square and compass. Johia, Josiah Henson was a Prince Hall Mason. Now, in Masonic jurisprudence, typically... Um, you know, only Grand Lodges could elect not new lodges. And from the Prince Hall Lodges, we see New Jersey and other lodges getting a foothold in Canada. So these Grand Lodges that were now being formed in the United States are sending out uh, uh, people to actually start setting up lodges. And records show that the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, George Shreve, deputized an individual by the name of... Thomas Her uh, Harmsley to start elect erecting lodges in Canada. In 1952, we see the first, first Prince Hall Lodge was established in Canada West in the city of Hamilton under the name Mount Olive No. 1. The following year, in 1853, Victoria Lodge No. 2 was established in the city of St. Catharines, and Olive Branch No. 3 was established in the city of Windsor. Uh, and all three lodges were constituted out of the, the Lodge in New Jersey. Now there is much speculation how it was that the Grand Lodge in New Jersey set up the first Prince Hall Lodges in Canada, but it appears it was a self-serving situation. For the parents of George Shreve migrated to Canada in 1850. Uh, George Shreve's father-in-law was Abraham D. Shad, which is a well-known name in, in the early days of the black communities within Canada. And what happened was, the, by 1850, George Shreve followed with his family. So, uh, I mean, George Shreve, in, in 1852, George Shreve followed with his family and then awaited these lodges to open so he would still have his Masonic Association. Now, 1856, it appears there was two lodges in Hamilton and one in St. Catharines that came together to form the first, we'll call Prince Hall family Grand Lodge. It was called Widow Son Grand Lodge, with Joseph B. Adams as the first Grand Master. In October of that year, the Grand Master and the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of New York officiated the inaugural ceremonies of Widow Son Grand Lodge. Uh, oh, and, and Widow Son then became a Grand Lodge of Prince Hall Masons in Canada West. Um, and it, as what was a tradition at the time, a Declaration of Settlements was published in the Hamilton Spectator, and it talked about uh, Widow Sun was uh, found uh, about the forming of Widow Sun, but Widow Sun Grand Lodge found itself in a precarious situation. It was not recognized by the Prince Hall National Compact that we were talked about earlier, because they were not prepared to submit totally 
to all the articles that the National Compact required. And that also included sending money. Uh, Prince Hall, it was on more than one occasion, Whittlesung reached out to the other Grand Lodges in Canada, uh, which were predominantly Caucasian. But as was customary at the time, these, Ca these Caucasian lodges did not recognize the Prince Hall affiliate, any lodges of Prince Hall affiliation. Um, so it kind of left them almost an island to themselves for a while. Now, by eight, but that did not stop them. By 1866, there were established lodges in Hamilton, St. Catharines, London, Ingersoll, Amherstburg, and Windsor. Uh, and in 1868, there was a lodge set up in Buxton. In 1869, there was a lodge set up in Shrewsbury, Ontario. Um, and all uh, uh, coming together uh, under the under Prince Hall, the Prince Hall family of, of lodges. Um, there was also lodges that were being set up in Chatham and London. Now, one noted Prince Hall Mason during the early days of the Widowson Grand Lodge requiring special mention is Reverend uh, Benjamin Stewart. For prior to migration to Canada, Reverend Benjamin Stewart was the deputy of the Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in New Jersey. Um, you know, a, and a deputy Grand Master is one is a position one below the Grand Master. Now he was a member of this, and it turned out he was also a member of the same lodge that the Grand Master George Shreve came out of. Now it is not sure when George Shreve moved to Hamilton in those early days, but it appears he was one of the early members of Mount Olive Lodge in Hamilton. Um, as at the Conference of African Methodist Ministers, which met in 1854 at Chatham, it was Benjamin Stewart who brought in a resolution that Canadian churches be set up. Uh, set us be set aside of the African churches and be renamed instead of the African Methodist churches they should be renamed the British Methodist Church in 1865 this resolution was finally adopted now while in office the Grand Master uh, now we have a very interesting situation that when the Grand Master at the time of Widowson Grand Lodge uh, Dr. a Grand Master T.M. Uh, Kennard uh, re ended up going back to the United States, which was often the case of what had happened uh, to a lot of the uh, folks who had come up into Canada prior to the Civil War. After the Civil War, now you've got a reverse migration of people going back to be with their families in the United States. And before he left, he appointed Benjamin Stewart to assume the position of Grand Master. And the Grand Lodge session opened with Benjamin Stewart sitting as Grand Master uh, in at that particular time. Now, in 1872, a call went out to amalgamate all the Prince Hall Lodges in this, at what was then now, the province of Ontario. What had happened was, we had uh, uh, a number of lodges that had been set up by other states that did not recognize the Widow Sun Grand Lodge, so there was a lodge set up in Chatham, uh, that was came out of the Prince Hall family of Grand Lodges in, in um, Michigan. There were lodges that were being set up out of New York. but uh, And this was just adding to the Masonic confusion in Ontario at the time. So the Grand Lodge set up, sent out a, a request to bring all these lodges in under one family of Grand Lodges. And ten lodges did come together representing these three Grand Lodges. These lodges agreed to come under uh, a new name. And because this was a new province, uh, the Grand Lodge was then called the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of the Province of Ontario. And these, and, uh, these lodges at that time were also located in Chatham, two from Windsor, Dresden, Buxton, Hamilton, St. Catharines, Toronto, Amherstburg, and London. And... Uh, at that time, Red, Reverend Benjamin Stewart was again elected to the position of Grand Master. Um, and it was kind of interesting. And on June 23rd, 1875, there was a call. There was a meeting called in Boston, Massachusetts, of all the Prince Hall family of Grand Lodges in North America, and the Grand Master 
of free and accepted Masons of the province of Ontario, Isaac Holder, made sure he was in attendance. A resolution was adopted at this meeting and in part read, We do advocate and recommend that the various Grand Lodges represented in this assembly, as soon as practical, after this adjournment, do open Masonic correspondence among themselves, leading to a union of the craft throughout the United States and other countries. Uh, this we see is now a breakdown of what was that old national compact uh, that was that that did not recognize any of the Grand Lodges that did not give them total allegiance. And when Grandmaster uh, Isaac Holder made his way back to Ontario, his Grand Lodge was already in session. And we can only imagine the jubilant time that, that the brothers felt in that particular time after the meeting in Boston when they knew they could now establish full communication with all the other Prince Hall Grand Lodges in the United States. Uh, it, you know, it appears that the lodges under the National Compact were becoming very disillusioned by the conduct of the National Compact. And it was two years later, in 1877, none of the Grand Lodges sent any delegates to this National Compact meeting, and the National Compact uh, virtually went, in, uh, went out of existence. Now, in 1913, keeping in step with the Prince Hall Grand Lodges of the United States. The word agent was dropped from the title and today keeping with the naming convention adopted by the descendants of African Lodge 459 and the charting of lodges in the province of Quebec, the official title of this Grand Lodge is now the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge, free and accepted Masons in province of Ontario and jurisdiction. Now today we have 10 active lodges under this Grand Lodge. Uh, there's Mount Olive Lodge number one in Hamilton, American Star Lodge number four in Windsor, St. John's number nine in Chatham, Eureka number 20 in Toronto, Mount Moriah number 24 in Montreal, Solomon Lodge number 26 in Ottawa, Utopia number 27 in Mississauga, Elam number 29 in Scarborough, King David number 30 in Montreal, and Jericho Lodge number 32 in Oshawa. Uh, that are in still in existence. Now we have, uh, you know, there, and as I have said, there are many who have questioned the legitimacy of the Prince Hall Masonry over the years, and the successors of Prince Hall Masonry have defended the fraternity against many charges that they were not legitimate Masons. In 1994, this was finally put to rest when the United Grand Lodge of England ruled that Prince Hall Masonry was regular in origin and of exemplary regularity today. Uh, and again, I always caution people when studying Prince Hall Masonry um, of the the many inaccurate statements that you will find out on the internet to this about Prince Hall Masonry. You know, um, I, as I had mentioned in the reading earlier, after they started forming the Grand Lodge in Canada and they reached out to the other Grand Lodges, there was pushback for recognition. I'm glad to report today that is not the case. Um, in, in 1989, the Grand Lodge of Connecticut uh, started uh, a process where the two Grand Lodges, uh, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge and the recognized which was originally Caucasian Lodge, and I can say all the Caucasian Lodges today most likely have men of color in their ranks because there's no discrimination that, that's really followed nowadays, came together to recognize one another. And this started a domino effect uh, to the point where the Prince Hall Lodges in almost every state recognized what was the established Grand Lodge of that state and the same thing is here in Canada uh, where the Grand Lodge, uh, uh, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ontario now has a seat at the table of the other Grand Masters when they meet in Canada uh, so recognition and correspondence among the various Grand Lodges has greatly improved and there we don't see those divides that once plagued Prince Hall Masonry. Now uh, I have uh, outlined a number of books that are really interesting if anybody wants to follow up on Prince Hall Masonry. Uh, these will all be uh, recorded I believe at the on the on the website on the uh, Facebook page but uh, there's a good introduction to Prince Hall Masonry. I recommend one that's called The Black Square and Compass uh, this was written by a celebrated Masonic art author, Joseph Wax Jr. There was another complimentary book called Inside Prince Hall, 
authored by David Gray. Uh, we have our own book here in Ontario, the Prince Alfred Masonry of Ontario, 1852 to 1933, uh, by Arlie Robbins. And there's a new, uh, public, relatively new publication that's come out that I really encourage people to read. Um, and it, 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 uh, first of all, the name of the book is the, um, uh, let me see, what is it called? I know it's, it's, um, I find it right here. The name of the book is The Lost Empire. You know, and all too often when we think of the Wild West, uh, the impressions that we get on the Wild West are those from the TV shows, the movies, um, and what item that is often neglected is the presence of men of color that went out west after the Civil War and really established a presence and a foothold. Uh, there is a, a very good author by the name of James R. Morgan III who wrote the book called The Lost Empire which goes on to describe uh, the influence of Prince Hall Masonry in the Wild West after the Civil War and, uh, and actually the, the presence of the the entire black exist uh, existence at that time just a phenomenal uh, book to read and uh, anybody even a non-mason would find this book very interesting to see the black history that was going on in the wild west well that con that concludes my my presentation um, and if anybody has any questions Trying to see how we can pull these up. Let's see. Uh, James, can yes. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear James, you. I'm going to read some co some questions to you. Okay. Uh, that you have on Facebook. So uh, I'll go ahead. Um, if there's an echo, just let me know. Um, a question. Um, I, fam uh, I am familiar with records in the McCurdy collection showing connections between Prince Hall Lodges. Are there other resources for uh, seeing Prince Hall Masons moving between the U.S. and Canada before World War II? Um, you know, I... I did mention a history book that we have available. Uh, I don't know specifically what you're talking about, but our history book outlines a lot of what was going on in Ontario uh, between 1852 and 1933. Um, you know, there's still so much out there that one has been lost, unfortunately. I myself have personally I kind of taken up the gauntlet and trying to find uh, some of these archives. I've been told that there are churches in Ontario even that still have possible references to the Masonic lodges that had met at their churches. Um, I know there was art, there was archives left with the Canadian uh, Archival Society. Uh, I'm trying to track down, but uh, specifically um, the best I could I could render if it's anything coming into Canada would be the Prince Hall Ma it's called Prince Hall Masonry Ontario 1852 to 1933 and uh, you know that book is available for a modest modest cost um, I will make sure I include some information with the with the museum on how somebody can acquire this book uh, we have and I don't have I, I apologize for not having it immediately with me and I didn't want to, we have our own website, um, and I'll make sure that the museum gets a, gets the name of our website, and on that website, I, I have a bookmark to it, and I didn't even think about it, but uh, there is reference on how one can acquire that particular book. It's, a, again, an interesting read on black history and Prince Hall Masonry in Ontario. Any other questions? Again okay. for another question. Sure. Can you hear me, James? 
I can hear you. No feedback. Okay, the question is, um, why do you think, you've mentioned articles that um, talk about, that um, basically create myths. Why do you think that these myths exist about masonry, such as them being cults, for example? You know, that, that goes on. Anything that's considered a secret society, masons do have secrets. Um, I often tell people I could speak nonstop for 24 hours about masonry. And this is uh, not. This is the fundamental aspects of masonry. But what happens is, any time there is a bit of exclusion, in other words, the, the meetings are not open to the public. You must be a mason to attend a masonic meeting. The minute things start happening between closed doors, people's imaginations will run wild. Uh, I've heard everything from devil worshippers to, like I said, uh, conspiracy theories to take over the world, let alone the any particular country. And I can assure you, this is couldn't be farther from the fact. But when people, uh, and Masons very seldom, then go out and defend themselves. Uh, they will much sooner try to express themselves by their own individual actions. Um, you know, they don't want to get into a big debate of, of, of what they are, because even to describe that gets into another problem. But I can assure you, uh, masonry is nothing more than an organization of good men who try to support themselves to become even better, and then to take what they have learned and practice it every single day and everything that they do. Uh, it's a lifelong journey. Uh, nobody in the world knows everything about masonry, and it's a it's a, a thing that grows with you as as you learn more. So I don't know how. Like I said, it it. Um, because because it's closed off to the public, I, I guess then people just want to assume the worst. Any other questions? Okay, I have one final question for sure. you. Sure. Um, someone is asking, why did you join the Black Masons? Oh, and we have one other question after that, too. So, well, you know, um, sorry, the question is, why did you join the Black Masons? I, I, I had some friends. It was amazing. I had very close, close friends, both social, socially and at the workplace. I was an engineer at Ford. Uh, there was a a very high-ranking manager at Ford who I knew quite well at the time. Talking with him, I found out he was a Mason in the Prince Hall Lodge in Windsor. I turned out I knew a majority of the Masons that were in the Lodge in Windsor that I had much respect for. Um, so I uh, naturally was gravitated towards them. You got to understand, Masonry, like I said, does not solicit membership. Masonry's intent on how we get members is to act in a certain way that people are drawn to us. Now, if we see somebody that's of a character that that would lend itself to becoming a good Mason, we can throw out tidbits that, that uh, shall I say, crumbs that hope they, they, they will gather up. But what happened in my case, I knew these people. I knew their the character of these people. Uh, I enjoyed, and since I have greatly enjoyed the fellowship, with them and the Prince Hall Masons all over the world. And like I said, with the recognition that we have, um, I, I have the ability to visit um, almost any lodge, any place in, in Canada, the United States, and the rest of the world for that matter. When you have good people together, it doesn't matter their race, religion, nationality, M masonry, is the fundamental denominator that levels all those things. Uh, one's status in society uh, is is not taken into account other than they're all good Masons. Okay, James, another question. Uh, when did the adoptive rite of masonry of the Eastern Star come into existence? 
Uh, I'd have to look into that. Um, you know, I saw originally they had formed a ladies' auxiliary in Canada before they brought in the Eastern Star. Um, you know, another little tidbit, the Eastern Star in, in Michigan actually came out of Canada. Um, but it has been in existence for some time as well. Um, and again, uh, as a lot of organizations of this type, in the last years we've been waning membership. Uh, and we're definitely trying to build up our, our membership in Eastern Star as well. Um, and that's again another I could that's a, uh, another subject that would lend itself to a, a, a whole presentation onto its onto itself. Um, what a lot of people don't realize that masonry has a number of auxiliary organizations that extend beyond that. Um, one time, all Shriners. Uh, Excellent, James. Uh, so I don't see any more questions. But okay. I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing such a fantastic job with your presentation. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and if any more questions do come in uh, after this, uh, I'll I will be happy to to answer them and and uh, send on the actual formal presentation to you. if I cut you off there um, there's a little bit of a delay so if you did have any further comments you wanted to add please feel free to oh. add. it's hall masonry uh, I always tell people if you're looking to join a group of people that that will help you become a better person I highly encourage looking to masonry and of course the ladies the Eastern Star um, I should mention um, originally, the Eastern Star were made up of direct bloodlines to Masons. Uh, they had to be a mother, sister, daughter, wife, um, it, to a Mason. But with the dwindling memberships, uh, in a lot of Grand Lodges, they've foregone that particular bloodline, and any good woman that, that is desirous of becoming an Eastern Star are being accepted. So on uh, both sides, the Masonics, the, the, the men's side, the ladies' side, it's a great organization to meet great people to uh, the fellowship with. And again, I, I want to thank the museum for giving me this opportunity to pass this information along. Again, thank you so much, James. That was fantastic. Thank you again. Signing off.